Good morning. My name is Dave Laval. I'm the CEO of Valerian and also a graduate of the college in 1999. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Bob Greifeld uh, to the stage today. Bob is currently the chairman of Virtu Financial and formerly the CEO and chairman of NASDAQ, where we worked together for several years. In, in fact, I had the privilege uh, of reporting directly to Bob for about seven months during a business transition, and I can say it was an absolute uh, privilege uh, uh, that, I, that I can think of in my, in my career. <clears throat> Bob um, has impacted the next generation of exchange leaders um, in, in a very measurable way. Uh, Stacy Cunningham at NYSE, um, you know, Adina Friedman, obviously, at NASDAQ, Chris Kincannon, Michael Blaugren, um, you know, um, Brian Harkins. I mean, the list is, is very long and distinguished. And I think that his impact in the U.S. financial markets will be felt uh, for a long, long time. Uh, as a business leader myself, I, I aspire to be able to um, impact my organization and build a culture that operates with a sense of urgency uh, and a, a professional discipline. Uh, that I experienced under Bob's leadership. Uh, his style is truly remarkable, and for that, uh, I will say thank you to Bob. So without further ado, I welcome Bob Greifeld to the stage with uh, John Jacobs, who is a fellow <laughs> for the Center of Financial Markets and Policy here at Georgetown. Thank you very much. Congratulations for joining the learning. Good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, really fun for me to be here with uh, a guy I've done this be with before. Um, one thing about Bob, um, from the first time he started at NASDAQ on May 12th, 2003, he immediately engaged in empl with, em with employees to an extent that we had never had before. And one of the things we did was a quarterly town hall meeting in one of our major offices that was webcast to the rest. So he could be in Stockholm, but we were all watching it wherever we were or in Rockville, Maryland, or Washington, or New York, or wherever. So, um, and as the CMO for Bob for many of those years, it was my job to um, uh, you know, facilitate that and, uh, uh, and, and do the process. So we've had a long history of, uh, yes. of, uh, of doing these kind of conversations. Many years ago now, John. Many years ago. Many years ago. But this is the reason we're here today. So um, the uh, Market Mover book. And um, so um, I'm really excited to be here to, uh, to be able to talk to Bob about it. So Bob, without getting without me wasting any more time, um, talk about the process of what compelled you to write a book. So first off, John has been the fastest talker I've ever known. <laughs> so you've slowed down a little bit, John, right? I'm trying. Come on, I am pick up the pace there. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see. So I would say this. Uh, one, writing the book is a difficult endeavor in that I like to believe that I live in the present thinking about the future. And the art of writing a book is you're forced to live in the past for a period of time. So it was the thing that I'd like to procrastinate it on. Uh, but that being said, uh, you know, when you look at the time period that's covered in the book, uh, in memory fades, but 2003, we were living uh, in the aftermath of the bursting of the dot-com bubble. So it was a really a different uh, time and place. Maybe we WeWorks, we felt we were going back there a little bit. Uh, and it also was a time where the floor the trading floor still predominated as a method of transacting in our markets and in other parts of the world. And the world changed quite dramatically. Uh, so I look at the book in a general sense. You had the period from 2003 to really the Google IPO, where we had headwinds with respect to how the economy was doing. From the Google IPO up until the great credit crisis, we had, I'll call it, tailwinds had a great credit crisis, mm -hmm. which was certainly uh, death-defying and a mark we'll never forget. And we talk about our role of that in the book. And then the economy gradually improved, and our diversification as a business, and John, you'll remember, really started to bear fruit. And yeah. we started doing better year after year, time after time. So that being said, you know the interesting backdrop of the historical times and also great business lessons in terms of how you respond to those environments and how do you take difficult times, good times, and try to you know, continue to execute quite successfully. Um, it's interesting because you know, the, the subtitle, Lessons from a Decade of Change at NASDAQ, when I read the book, um, which I did a couple times, it was um, amazed me just to, to, because you forget about it all, because yeah. we did so much. And for those who don't know, there were Bob from his tenure at NASDAQ, we did 44 acquisitions. And that was a 
just a tremendous pace because we had a vision of where we wanted to go and that and some of those things organically were not going to happen in nearly the time they took. Plus, I think we caught a time of consolidation and things like that. Um, so over time, you learned a lot of lessons, right? Lessons learned. What, if, think about, like, name three things that you wished you'd, that you realized by the end of the, your time in NASDAQ that you wish you knew on your first day when you walked in the door? Well, I know about the first day, but you know, my, my first day I knew I, what I had to do on the transaction side of the business. So I had been a software entrepreneur integrating into the NASDAQ system. So I knew how bureaucratic and non-competitive <laughs> the systems were. So I had a clearer path. I knew that it had been part of the regulator, and our job was to separate from the regulator uh, get to be really set up to go public, which we uh, eventually did. So that I was ready. But as I was writing the book, I recognized how woefully I was prepared for different aspects of the job, which I didn't really knew existed. So one of them was to come down to this great town and government <laughs> relations, right? So coming from a technology background where you wanted to change a feature in your system, you would just do that. So here, when you're at NASDAQ, I remember the first time somebody was explaining, Ed Knight or somebody, saying, no, if you want to make the system change, we have to make a rule filing. And that might take a month or two months before you can put it in. I was like, really? How, how can it be that way? So the whole government relations thing, and I remember quite naively uh, when somebody said, you know, Chairman Oxley wants to meet you, who was, you know, obviously Sarbanes-Oxley, who's the head of the House Financial Services Committee. So I was sitting there saying, that's pretty good. Oxley wants to meet me. And then somebody said, you know, Bob, he just wants to raise money, right? He just wants to use you to raise money. So I had to learn that aspect of Washington and how they were so important to our, our job. Uh, the second aspect was, you know, publicity. Uh, you know, when you're an uh, entrepreneur in America, you can be quite invisible. You're CEO of NASDAQ, then you have, you know, we had beat reporters who covered what we do. So that was somewhat new to me, and mm -hmm. you had to guide me through that uh, process. And the third was when I first got there, uh, the salespeople for our listing business would come to me and say, Dick Grasso's in the account. And at first, I thought it was a typical salesperson saying, well, you know, they always want to get your attention and consume resources. But I would call the CEOs, and Dick Grasso was in the account. So I went in there thinking I'm going to spend 110% on getting the organization ready to go public, getting the technology ready, and getting our market share up in the transaction business. And yet I found myself spending more time calling CEOs and visiting companies trying to explain why NASDAQ was better than the New York Stock Exchange. So those three things, you know, the listing business, mm -hmm. government relations, and uh, clearly the publicity. If I had to start it again, I wish I had a greater background in that and had to learn as we went. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and Rena, her opening comments today were talking about the center was born a lot out of the putting the dialogue together between the industry and the regulators because it's it's just most, one of the most critical intersections. And uh, but and uh, you know, at night for years it always said to me, well, if you make your index business regulated, I can you know I can protect you more. I'm like, no, 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 no. We don't want regulation. That business. remember we just fought tooth and nail to keep the index, and for you indexers out there, you're welcome, but we kept the indexes businesses out of the regulatory re regime. Yeah. Um, so another you know, er early question, and it was, you, you covered in the book a little bit too, is that you know, walking with your background and seeing it, um, to walk in all of a sudden, you own a broadcast studio. You own this thing in Times Square, right? That's not, I, I'm sure that was kind of a, what is this and why am I doing this? And, see, the, see, John is just being quite clever because it's yes. going to lead to a compliment for John, yes. right? Uh, <laughs> so, so there, you know, we're, we're not cost competitive. We're losing $250,000 a day, uh, which can only go on for so long. So we're trying to cut cost, uh, obviously. And I had come from a background where I started in ECN. I knew how they ran, right? They had a shoestring string operation had a couple of Unix servers, changed the code all the time. I said, we have to look more like them. So I go to the market site in Times Square, and we're spending like $28 million a year on keeping this market site going. And I said, OK, this is an easy one. Let's just get rid of the NASDAQ market site from my background. That's $28 million, right? You have all these different things you can cut, and this stands out with bright lights. Yeah. And John emotionally says, no, we can't do that, and Bruce also. Uh, and then I said, no, well, we're going to go 
you know, shut down this market site. How long will it take me to get out of the lease? So then, simultaneously, I'm meeting the listed companies, and they're all talking about how great it is to come to the market site. They bring their parents there, their kids there. They start tearing up. You know, it's a signal, uh, uh, you know, activity in their life to do that. And I said, okay, maybe John has something there. <laughs> so what we did is we cut the expense base down from like Absolutely. 20, 35 million to 25 million dollars, which is still unconscionable, but I recognized it had something uh, of value. And that was again a new thing for me: the concept of brand, right? The transaction <laughs> business had zero element of brand. It was a business about reads and feeds, right? What are you charging? What's your response time? Nobody cared about what your brand was, island, you know, mm -hmm. anything that mattered. The listing business was quite the opposite, where brand mattered. So we kept the market site open. We actually invested in it through the years. And I thank John and others uh, because it would have been a mistake for the listing business, and it was clearly a global branding event. And when we bought the OMX exchanges, which were basically all the Nordic exchanges, they were ecstatic to be able to come to Times Square with their listed companies to use the, the, the market site. It never yeah. ceased to amaze me in my 30 plus years how important a bell ringing is. Um, for people mark, to mark events and things like that. And well, we one, did find we were spending over $1,000 a week in flowers. Yeah, so that, we, that was an easy we cut. We shot the flowers. We shot the flowers. <laughs> and then I cut, cut back the catered breakfast every morning. So I caught Bob eating two bagels one day. like, stop. But uh, anyway, the thing that was so interesting, or just inside baseball for you guys to know, you guys know that when we hit that button, it doesn't really open the market or close the market. Okay? So just, a, just an aside. But how many CEOs think it does? They're like, ready to, oh, I can't hit too early. I don't want to hit, you hit it two seconds late, you know, but anyway. Um, so that brings me to, to, to another point. So you do talk, the, the, let's talk about the listings business because you had, um, you have met like every single person um, that is anyone in this, in this modern economy globally because of the listings business to a certain extent, right? I mean, either they went public on NASDAQ or they'll be public later on in NASDAQ. But um, so, you know, what is, what's, what's something that you find that um, people may not realize about all these, you know, men and women, these high-powered CEOs? And well, I'll tie back to the point with the opening. It just can't, came to me. So we had done a transaction with Dubai, right, mm -hmm. where we owned a piece <clears> of the Dubai <throat> exchange and they owned a piece of NASDAQ. So we're doing a market open ceremony uh, in Dubai and the uh, crown, crown prince is going to come uh, to ring the bell at the time. And uh, so he's running late. And the people come up to me and said, well, we have to delay the market open. <laughs> and I said, well. <laughs> I said, no. And again, I mean, he's a sovereign ruler, right? He has yeah. life or death power over people. But I said, no, we really can't right. do that. But when he comes, we'll, you know, we'll fake it and do it again, that kind of thing. The market's going to open at, at 9.30. So they, again, thought that he was pushing the bell to open the market there. Yeah. But, you know, with respect to, you know, the ability to uh, meet the different CEOs, it's interesting is that uh, uh, when I first came to NASDAQ, I got to know John Chambers, who was the CEO of Cisco, very well. And coming from a technology background, it dawned on me, I said, he had suppliers that were, uh, he was spending or spending $20 million a year with who could not get to John Chambers. And I said, why is it that we can? Then it dawned on my head, they care about their stock price, right? So it gives you instantaneous access to the uh, uh, CEOs there. So that was uh, kind of fun. But what I, I said after spending time with them uh, is you realize that every CEO you meet uh, is very smart mm -hmm. and very hardworking. Uh, but I met many who failed. And I said, okay, what is the common theme? Why did they fail? And you know, to me, it was very clear. Uh, you fail because you work on the wrong things, right? So you have a to-do list, which you never get to the bottom of. So you have to pick those things that represent leverage for your time, right? And will have the most impact on the organization. And you also have to be very comfortable with not doing other things well, right? So you meet many CEOs who want to do everything well. Not possible. The, in the to do list is, is endless. So if I looked at that recurring theme, uh, they had a clear vision, right? Because I've seen some CEOs who just, uh, you know, you not think they're working that hard as you get to know them, but they know exactly what they have to do. So that's, you know, uh, underlooked skill set for, you know, obviously success. Um, so there's, a, you know, you've had, 
just your long, long successful career. You were at NASDAQ for, for 14 years, I think. So um, high points, low points, some of the high points, low points of 14 years. Well, I say, you know, with the high points, so when I first got there and I covered this in the book, I kept saying to myself, I'm six months too late, right? So it wasn't like it's, okay, we're going to just do great here. So we continue to lose the money. Uh, we continue to lose market share. So you're three, six months in, you say, okay, we haven't got where we need to be yet. So that was treacherous times. We were making progress. We were doing the proper nation building, but it takes a while for it to manifest itself. Uh, so when I, you mentioned the 44 acquisitions, uh, they all were optional except for one, right? <laughs> the one, we were at institutional risk, right? We might not have existed in form if we really didn't complete the INET acquisition. So INET gave us the best technology uh, in, on the street, and it also gave us necessary market share, which buttressed our, mm -hmm. our listings claim. Everything else was optional. Now, to divert a little bit, I knew INET was special. And what I cover in the book is back when I was a software entrepreneur, this is in the early 90s, uh, we had a trading firm startup called Daytech. And they were a customer of our back office system. All of a sudden, they're doing these massive amounts of trades, and we're getting paid per ticket. So we're loving it. So I said, let me go out to Staten Island, uh, where they're located, and see what's, what it's about. And you know, I don't know much at this point. And I'd never been in a neighborhood in Staten Island. And this is the world before uh, cell phones. I, I came from Queens, so I kind of knew the feel, but it was still different. And I'm going block after block of row house, and I can't find out where to go. And then I turn one block, and I see a Porsche, BMW, and Mercedes in front. I said, I think that's the house. That I the think house. that's the house. <laughs> so uh, what's that? Sounds like Joe Camelot. Sounds like what? Joe Camelot. OK. Yeah. OK. Uh, so I get there. And then this is the dawn of electronic trading, right there in that basement house. And that was the dawn of the technology that eventually became the INET technology, right? And that time, they had a satellite feed. They were taking the feed in. And they had a simple program which identified the six risers and the six fallers. And they knew that the manual-based NASDAQ market makers probably weren't keeping up. And that was the mm -hmm. order flow to go after. And that was the beginning. And that became the watcher technology, which became INET. So I had deep knowledge of the industry. I said, I need to own this technology. We were banking on a product that we had out of Europe, which is based on Microsoft Windows, which I had no, not a lot of faith in at that time. And you know, it could have just not worked, and then you know, we would be in a different place. That was uh, you know, one of the highlights that we were able to make that and you know, uh, make that deal happen. And we came out of that deal levered almost 10 times. Mm -hmm. uh, so to the extent the economy went sour six months after that, then we would have been one of the guys swimming without any uh, swimming trunks on, according to Warren Buffett. So that was that. Uh, the low point, you know, obviously has to be Facebook. You know, we bungled, botched that <laughs> IPO. And again, we cover it in the book. It's interesting to me, the easiest thing for a CEO to do was the problem is to fire a bunch of people, right? And that's, you know, you got the reflex to go, go do that. Uh, but it was a lot more complicated than that. And what led me on the trail of discovery is, one, uh, there was no incompetence in terms of what we'd done, that we had a job too hard for us. But what had happened is I'd let the engineering talent, which I always had great respect for, over-engineer something, right? And the user, the business heads, didn't have any enough say in it. And so we were re refueling in flight when we could have landed the plane and fueled it on the ground. And that was... The opening IPO cross wanted to be perfect. And if there are any cancellations, it would run itself again. In this unique situation, the cancellations kept increasing. Mm -hmm. So the cross had to keep running. And it wasn't catching up to itself. It was actually falling behind. So basically, I had to somewhat go back to where we were, John will remember, in 2003, in institutionalized procedures. And I cover it in the, in the book is, you know, the right answer today, right, because how we, we look more like a startup in 2004, and that was the right answer, that's what the market wanted. But that's not the right answer tomorrow, because the industry had matured, the requirements had matured, and you had to look more like you looked in 2002. So we changed the culture, which is the hardest thing. And what's interesting is the people who had grown up with me in the culture, which is more of a startup culture, they then self-selected to leave. Right, because those development people, if I was starting a company, I would hire them tomorrow. 
but that's not what NASDAQ was, right. and they didn't want to be there where they had to operate within, call it the man and the machine, that kind of thing. So that was, a, you know, we became a better company for it, but it was a not a pleasant way to learn. Right? Oh, definitely not. Um, both the examples you give, the high point and the low point, are both te technology-based. One is, you know, you, trying to get the best technology to compete in, in, in survival mode, and the second is, um, you know, kind of over-engineering our technology to a certain extent. Um, yeah, because when we acquired INET, we acquired the culture, too. You right. know, it wasn't a hacker culture, but these were, you know, counterculture guys who would wear shorts to work, which seemed radical back at the time, and they were the smartest guys on the planet, and we let them kind of run, run the show, and they ran it too far. Right. And it was interesting because in the beginning, you know, people assumed NASDAQ was the best out platform out there. People were not in the industry, and it was the insiders who knew we were not up to snuff. And then later on, it was like uh, it was a, a blow that we, as the people who invented the modern IPO and the met, invented the technology to you know, make a mistake like we have with Facebook. But in both cases, the resilience of the brand actually helped over time and, uh, and, and so on. Um, well, parallel to the 44 acquisitions, the other thing is, you know, you started on May 12th, and on June 26th, we did a press release announcing we're writing off $100 million worth of businesses and some ventures like NASDAQ Japan and NASDAQ Europe and some of those things. And so you had a parallel path of one is, you know, figuring out where you, we needed, to, what gaps we had, and secondly, how to clean up. The, were those decisions easy to make or easy identified or they're not easy to make but well you were there so one yeah. you know we had to just basically become efficient right so that's one path the second is okay what do we choose to do and some of the things we're doing didn't make any sense <laughs> others made a lot of sense but we just couldn't afford to do that right. anymore we didn't have the management bandwidth and or the capital to do that and what we set up is the socratic debates with respect to these initiatives. John was involved with some of them, so I'd have people argue the pro and the con. And you know, I would say nine out of 10, the answer would reveal itself, and right. I wouldn't have to weigh in. One out of 10 times I, I had to there, but you'd have d different sides. It's never a question of black and white. Right? Right. In any decision you make, it's not, okay, that clear cut. It's always a shade of gray that you have to choose from. So you know, we went through that for the first number of months. And then there were a number of initiatives that we had to stop, even though they had merit, but we had financial constraints or management uh, bandwidth constraints. One was the over-the-counter bulletin board with uh, Medina just about wanted to choke me on when I said, no, we're killing that one. And, and that, so I was going to say two comments on, I just remember this, the, the debates. Most of those debates, Bob would assign an EVP to one side, another EVP to another side, and he always made you pick, uh, take the side you didn't want. And so you're having to argue, which is good, it gets the flesh issue. Well, except, I made it clear that you're going to be judged on the quality right. of your argument. Right? Except that, on this one OTC bulletin board, I was totally against it because I thought it was just not where we needed to be. And Adina was totally for because she was running it. So Bob let us argue those two sides. I swear Adina didn't talk to me for two weeks because I, I won and we closed it down. <laughs> but I swear she didn't talk to me for two weeks. Like, oh, it was, it was it's so. And Chris Cannon, who was running strategy at the time, I remember him at the end of the meeting goes, it's like a dead silence, and he goes, well, that's some passion. We haven't seen that here before. So um, why don't you guys start moving down to the mics for questions from the audience. Um, so I do want, you have to go to a mic, Nandini. Um, so one of the questions, one of the things I do want to mention is um, for the students here, um, to talk, tie back academia and your career. So you um, were being interviewed to become CEO of NASDAQ. What had you done your paper on in graduate school? Uh, I forget. No, I, it was interesting. At NYU, I did my thesis on the NASDAQ stock market and how, te how technology was changing the market and the equity market. So, so yeah. who knew at the time? Yeah, it gave right? you great bona fides. So, yeah. Tom. Had an opinion. Thank you, John. Um, Tom Luby, I'm the uh, president of Populous Markets. And a question for you, Bob. Direct listings are the topic du jour. Right. Uh, Silicon Valley has been... Uh, getting itchy about this possible new way of taking a company public. What's your sense? What does your gut tell you, having been through so many iterations of innovation in the IPO space, what does your gut tell you about the potential for direct listing, perhaps in some minor tweak, tweaked form, uh, for the future of uh, public offerings? Well, I, I'm a big proponent of direct listings uh, within the proper construct. Right? So I think it's going to be a niche part of the IPO market won't be the dominant part. And to set the context, when companies go public and they go up 40% on the day or down 40% of the day, to me that always has seemed quite inefficient and mm -hmm. wrong. 
And if I'm the company board of directors or CEO, you know, I don't want to be taking a bet on up 30 or down 40. Sure. Uh, I just want to, you know, get, get the price. So direct listing, if I don't need capital at the time, I go public, let the market establish the price, and then I do essentially a secondary and raise capital at that price or maybe a 3% discount or 5% discount, depending. So it separates the pricing action, right, of where I raise money from the act of going public. So I, I, I like that. Uh, but let's be clear. Most companies, when they go public, want money, right? So that's why I say it would be niche. Niche companies don't need uh, money when they go public. Go public. Let the market establish the price. Then you do your secondary 6, 12, 18 months later. So I think it's here to stay, uh, but it's not going to be 50% of the market, you know, 10, 20%. Uh, yes, my name is Hirak Christian Kim. I'm the president of Georgetown Collaborative Diplomacy Initiative. Um, I'm currently in talks with the chairman of GOP to be the nomination for the Republican ticket uh, to run against Don Beyer, who's the U.S. House of Representative member representing 8th District uh, in Virginia. So hopefully I'll win that election in 2020 if I do become the nominee of the Republican Party. Uh, I was wondering uh, what advice you would have for me if I do win. What do you think is my priority for the two years that I would hold the term uh, in terms of financial markets and policies related to that? That's a, okay, that was a long one. <laughs> so I would say this, you know, when you look at financial markets today, first to be on the happy side, they're the most efficient they've ever been. It's the best for retail investors it's ever been, right? Commissions are now going to zero, which is hard, hard to contemplate. The fundamental challenge the financial markets regulation has is how to allow innovation to happen, right? So the regulator will always be behind, right? That's by definition. But how do you narrow that gap while keeping safety and soundness in, in the system? 